As I said, it's so good to be in God's house. It's so good to be able to be encouraged by the Word of God. We get to we get to do this, you know. Um, it's never been so needed as it is in the day and the times that we are living, as uh, as we see the things that are taking place before our eyes and unfolding. We see, uh, thank God to His Word, uh, God has revealed it uh, by His Word. And, uh, and, and this is why God tells us when you see all these things, you know, be of good courage, you know, uh, take heart in, in these things because this, this, I know it seems bad, but I can tell you this, it's good news tonight. Uh, let me say that again. It's, it's good news tonight. Amen. God is in control and, and uh, you know, soon and very soon we are going to see the King and, uh, we, so we're so excited about that, so thankful tonight that we know that we're going to see God. As well. Let's go to the Lord tonight. Would you stand where you are, and we're just going to take these needs before God. He is. He hears us as we pray. We had such a great uh, time yesterday. We weren't able to air it. We had issues with the with the with the instruments, and so. Um, but but man, what a great time we had in prayer. And uh, I just believe that God, I, I know that God answers prayer. God doesn't do anything apart from prayer. Um, that's something you and I have to understand. We have to know God does nothing apart from his people praying. And, his, and the prayers of his people are, are what bring the answers. It's not that God is, is limited but this this is why it's a this is why it's a, a commission. It's a commission. It's you and God working together. It's the body of Christ. That's who we are. So, Father, we thank you tonight, and we thank you, Father, that we are able to come into your presence and come before your throne boldly, God. Which with each one of these requests, Lord, uh, the, these twins that were born, Father, you see, God, the, the need. Lord, you see the need in, in, in this child that, God, that your spirit, Father, ministers, God, to her body, Father. I pray that, God, that you would, you would intervene in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. And, Father, we lift her up, God, and we lift these up, God. You see the, these, these young people that have passed away even today, Father, from stroke or, and, and whatever, God, it may have been, but God, we put it in your hands tonight. And you see the hurt, Father, the devastation, Father, that this brings uh, uh, upon the family. And Lord, but we put them in your hands, God, and we pray, Father, for your protection upon our children. God, wherever they are, Father, because of the the times that are just so uncertain today, God, and we just ask that, God, that you would continually lead them and guide them and direct their steps. We lift up Pastor Johnson and Sister Mary and Brother Mike McGee and, and, and Father, Sister Karina, God, and all of these, Father, that, have, that have, are under this, under, under the, the, this sickness, God, of COVID. And today, God, we just, we just bring them up before you. But, God, we, Father, we trust in you. We know you, God. You are faithful. You are able to do above and beyond what we ask or think. And, God, we know, Father, that you are actively working on our behalf. And, God, we just, we just lift our prayers to you. And, and, God, we make them known to you as your word says. Make your request known. And, God, that's what we're doing here tonight, God. We're making these things known, Father. We, we pray, Father, for, for Nevia's family, God, and in, in, in this situation, you know, God, and I pray that, Father, that even now, God, that you by your mighty right hand would intervene, Father, and that, God, that you would interject yourself even as your people pray, as their children pray, God. And, God, we, we just expect, Father, a, a good result, Father, as your, as your word promises, Father, that, God, that you are, you are mightily moving in the midst of your people. And, and God, tonight we just pray for the teachers and the students and, and everything, Father, that, that is taking place, God, even in, in Afghanistan, God, and around the world, and our brothers and sisters, God, that are just under, under such threat of 
death, God, even tonight. And, and God, we just pray that you would strengthen them and build them up, God, that your Holy Spirit would be with them. And Father, there are so many, God, even in this world today, Father, that that they have lost their peace, God, because, because of all that's taking place. But God, you have taught us not to look at the storm and not to pay attention to the things that are that are happening around us but to keep our eyes upon you the prince of peace and god you are the one that steadies us you are the one that puts our feet in a wide place god you cause us not to stumble nor fall god your word says that god a thousand to fall at our side and ten thousand at our right hand that may come near us but father it will not come upon us but god God, it is your spirit and presence, and it's your power. And I pray that, God, even tonight, that your people would rise in faith and believe, God. And know, Father, that you are actively working presently, even at this moment in our lives. We pray, Father, even now, God, for traveling mercies, God, over a sister who and her family who will be traveling, God. We pray, Father, for the universities, God. We pray, Father, for Nathan's sister. And God, these, as they go to these new universities, God, I pray that, Father, that the light in them, Father, would be so great. And that, God, that there would be, Father, just a revival, God. Uh, Father, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would move in them and use them. And, God, change the the, the atmosphere, the, 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 the area that is around them, Father, their sphere of influence, God. I pray that, God, that you would help them and lead them and direct them and teach them by your Holy Spirit, God. Let your anointing, Father, be upon them and go before them. And God, we give it all to you and we give you all the praise and glory and honor, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. To you be the glory. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. You may be seated tonight. We are so, as I said, we are so blessed. We are so blessed to be here. I'm telling you just... Just look around you. You're blessed. You're blessed. I, I'm I'm blessed this 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 uh, evening, and and you know we have to we have to many times. This is what we have to do. I I, I know there's that old saying, pick yourself up by your bootstraps. And I I <laughs> I mean I get what they're trying to say, but uh, but but this is what the Bible says: encourage yourself in the Lord. You see, the, the, there are times when we. Uh, are facing many difficulties from every angle and all around us. We can only imagine what David was going through when he was, of course, hanging out with the Philistines uh, around somebody that he shouldn't have been, fighting against a people that his, he shouldn't have been. It was his own people. And the Philistines became afraid because the they were fighting the Israelites. They were fighting against Saul and his kingdom. And David was going to help them, and David was behind them. And so the king has this bright idea, and I believe that it was the intervention of God at that moment. I believe that God divinely intervened at that moment. And the king of the Philistines said, you know what, David? Uh, some of his officers said, well, what if, what if we're concentrated on the battle before us, and David attacks us from behind, and we're going to be really in trouble? And so he says, just tell David to go home. We've got this. So David goes back home to Ziklag. And, and, and some of you know the story. He comes and finds that the Amalekites and, and bands of them have gone through, taken all the women, all the sheep. Nobody, they didn't kill any of the children or the women or anything, but they just captured them. And, and not just Ziklag where David was at, but many other cities because it was the time of year when kings went to war. And so, so there were many armies that were out on the battlefield where there's, the, the Amalekites came up behind and started raiding the cities while the, while the men were at war. And so David comes home, and it was a, it was a very devastating moment at that, at that time. Everything is lost. Homes are burned. Everything you've worked for and built and everything else, and, and you're the leader, and now the people were looking at him and thinking of stoning him. And the Bible says that one, that, that one phrase, David encouraged himself in the Lord. And I believe sometimes we just need to stop and give, get, get, get some encouragement in the Lord. If he did it before, he's going to do it again. 
I'm telling you, if God has done it once, he'll do it again. If he, if he took down one giant, he'll take down the next 300 giants. I'm telling you, there will, if, if God be for me, who can be against me? David was the same one that said, he delivered me because he delighted in me. And, and I'm telling you, God delights in, in, in his people. And David knew how to praise God and bring God into the circumstance, into his situation. And sometimes we, we, wonder, we, we want God into the situation. Well, I can tell you how to get God there. We talked a little bit about it yesterday. You have to praise God. Because the Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people. And that's how David began to encourage himself in the Lord. Because if God gave me power over the, over the bear and gave me strength over the lion, he knew that it was the power of God. He gave me power over the giant and he'll give me power over this thing too. And so God, he encouraged himself in the Lord, brought God into the situation. Everything changes. See, the enemy wants to discourage us. He wants, he means to destroy us. And we're going to see a little bit of that even today. Uh, as we, we left off on these thoughts, um, the last time we were together, Exodus chapter 9, um, Exodus chapter 9, this is, this is the part where, where um, Moses is coming against Pharaoh God says to, to Pharaoh, I, I could have sent one plague by now. He says, I could have sent a plague and I could have completely wiped you off the face of the earth. That's what he tells Pharaoh. I, I, could, have, I could have taken you out. And, 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 and see, and we talked about this. You know, God, God can send plagues and he can send another plague. And he can send another plague. So what we're facing, even in our world today, can I tell you this? It is a wake-up call. We don't want to be like Egypt. We don't want to be stubborn. We don't want to be hard-hearted. We don't want to be stiff-necked. We want to respond to God correctly. But the Bible says that he hardened the heart of Pharaoh. And in verse 16, he says, For this cause have I raised thee up to show in thee my power. And that's what he tells, he says about Pharaoh. He says, I raised you up so that I could show my glory through you, through your stiff neck, through your hard heart. And that's what God does, often does. And, and everything that God does, he does for a reason. That's why he says all things work together for good. You see, what the Israelites didn't realize was God was working all things for their good. Sometimes we don't like the path that God takes, right? We don't, we don't like the way that God works things for our good. Well, God, if that's, you know, I mean, I think I've got a better way of doing this. And we many times like to give God suggestions, but God is working all things for our good. And he was doing this very thing for the Israelites. They were in captivity for 400 years. And we're, well, I, I don't want to, and, and so, and so he calls Pharaoh and he waits until Pharaoh gets to the point where Pharaoh has, has, has shown his entire strength against the children of Israel. See, Pharaoh was, was, was given a lot of leeway. And let me tell you that God gives the devil a lot of leeway. He gives him a lot of liberty, and God could have destroyed him the first time in, in, the, first, in the first plague, but God drew him out, as we talked about ten times, until the full force of his power, of Pharaoh's power, was put on display. So Pharaoh at the very end brings out his chariots, all of his army, all of his men, and everything. And God doesn't, as we said, God doesn't destroy Satan, Satan's plan in its infancy. Satan tries to do that with us. See, the moment Satan realizes that God inhabits you and you have made a decision to follow God... Satan means to destroy you. That's all there is to it. He means to destroy you the moment you make a decision. When you come to the Lord in prayer, and this is something you have to understand, this is an ongoing thing 
in an ongoing battle that you're going to continue to, to go through the rest of your life. I would like to say, I, I would like to tell you that it's, that it's not. But, but this is something that will continue. And so, so the moment you make a decision, Satan is right there to, to challenge the decision. But with God, God lets Satan carry out his plan. And he lets Satan, uh, he lets Satan flex his armies and show all of his power, and and he lets Satan do all of these things, puts everything out on display, and then God just crushes him and takes his army and in one full swoop crushes his entire army and brings the Pharaoh down. You and I have to understand and re remember, um, we're soldiers. I was, I was, you know, talking a little bit about this with Daniel today. Um, we're soldiers. And Paul says, Paul says, uh, be a good soldier. And a, and a good soldier doesn't entangle himself with the affairs of this life. But he lives and he serves the one who has enlisted him because he wants to honor him and make sure that he doesn't disappoint the one who has enlisted him. And as we say this, it's so easy to get distracted because we live in this world. But we have to continually have that mindset that we're soldiers. It's, but, 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 we, but it's so hard to make the, the to, to different, differentiate sometimes the difference between, you know, well, well, I'm in the world and it's hard not to get entangled in the world and in the affairs of this world. But at the same time, this is not my home. And I was telling him, I said, it reminds me of a soldier. And we've seen them many times when they're fighting in other countries, even like many of them that have already come back from Afghanistan. That, that, it, especially when they have a long tenure in a place. Every morning they still get up and they put on the garb. They put on their gear. They, they, they dress up and they, and they know that they are a soldier even though it seems like they're in a time of peace. And it doesn't matter what day it is, you're going to see them marching out there and, and they're, they're, they're in full array. But they're not to get entangled with the affairs of the people. And they're not to get all caught up. But it's hard sometimes because the people that you are there protecting become a lot like family. And it's easy to become distracted. But what reminds them, I believe, many times is every morning they wake up and they, they, they suit up. And they put on the full armor. And so, so you and I are in this world and we're not to get entangled with the affairs and, and, and we need to know what we are here for and we need to know why God has called us and we need to know that there is a reason and a purpose and Satan means to distract you. Satan means to entice you. Satan means to entangle you because if he can get your mind off of it and if he can get you distracted, then he can come in for the attack. And so many Christians are taken by surprise because we get our eyes off of the fact that there is a specific reason why we are here. And God has placed us here to destroy the works of Satan. And so Pharaoh was only a foreshadow. And God waits until Satan gets his full plan out on display. And we're going to see that in just a little bit, even more so. But we're not up against Pharaoh. We're up against the full power of Satan and the church is being as, as being the instrument of God's purpose. You and I are the instrument. You and I are the body of Christ. You and I are the one that God is using against this present darkness. You and I. As I said, God's not going to do anything without prayer. He's not going to, do, he's not going to move. You say, well, God has to move. Well, then pray. 
Well, doesn't God care about the way that I feel? Yes, God cares about the way that you feel, but he's not, he's not, he's not necessarily moved by your emotions. He's, he's God and, and you and I do not understand the order of God. And we talked about this even last night. And if you get a chance, once they get it up there, you, you probably need to go back. But God is a God of order. And so whenever you read the book of Revelation, what you, you are going to see, whenever John begins to describe the throne room, whenever John begins to describe God, whenever he begins to describe all the things that he sees, what you see is absolute order. You don't see somebody running into the throne room. You don't see some derelict running into the throne room. You don't see it. What, what happens is when something comes up, all of a sudden you see one of the beams, and when they move in, they walk, they, they come in. And, and you and I can't even imagine, but they're, they're, they're arrayed in, in such clothing that you and I couldn't even fathom the, the, the holiness of God. And, and these beams just, I, I can't even picture how, how large these beams are, but they're moving to the throne of God, and they, they're not afraid. They're not moved. They're not surprised. Everything is done decently and in order. And so God isn't moved by your little emotions. He's not moved by your little hissy fit. He's not moved because you think that He should move. He's not moved because you say, because you claim to know Him and you can quote a, a few scriptures. He's not moved by that. The Bible says He's only moved. He's moved by faith. So we're not up against Sarah. We're, uh, Pharaoh, we're up against Satan himself. And so as the instrument of God, we have to be proved absolutely superior to Satan. You and I, that's what we're going through right now. Remember, count it all joy. We talked about it on Sunday. Count it all joy. Joy when you've come into various temptations and trials for, 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 the, for the strengthening of your faith. Endurance is, is being proved in you. And God is building you up. And He's proving to devil that what He has done in you, the devil cannot undo. And I, I, I don't know if you're... If, if, I, but, but listen... I don't, I don't care what you hear. I can tell you, I've, I've heard a lot of things that are out there that are not godly. I've heard a lot of, uh, of, of preaching, if you will, and these little phrases. And, and the sad thing is, is Christians get caught up in them. I see some Christians, and they'll quote a preacher, and the next line you hear, they're quoting somebody from some Hindu. And they're, they're, then the next thing you know, they're quoting some, somebody from some other religion. But it's a good quote. And so the flesh gets all excited about it. And the flesh says, whoa, well, well that, oh, that made me feel good. And, and so the flesh accepts and receives everything. But God doesn't receive it and, and accept everything. And so we can get all excited about it. And just because we get excited about it doesn't mean that it's of God. And doesn't mean that God's excited about the things that you're excited about unless you're excited about the things that He's excited about. He's not moved by those things. And we have to understand that. And so we have to be proved. And therefore God builds. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't wall us in. He allows the full display of the enemy and His power against us because He knows it's not merely against us, but it is against Christ in us. Now, when the Lord gets His life into His people, when, when you come to a place where God's life is in you, then, then there's one thing for certain that will happen to you. That, that instrument, that body of Christ will begin to draw out death against itself. You automatically begin to become a magnet to Satan. <laughs> I, I mean, hey, that, I, I know that was exciting, wasn't it? What do you mean I become a magnet to Satan? Yeah, the moment Satan smells 
that, that, and, and has that sense that Christ lives in you, automatically He comes against you. See, that ought to encourage you today. Because, because obviously Satan sees something in us many times that we don't see ourselves. You see, sometimes we can't see God in us. Sometimes because we, we, we depend too much on our feelings. Well, well, God must have not have been there. Why? Because I didn't feel Him. Well, I can tell you this. There's going to be a lot of times that you're not going to feel God. Doesn't mean that He's not there. And, and, and so Satan comes, the moment you and I and the life of God is discovered in the believer, we draw out death against ourselves because Satan is against the life that is in us. And you wonder why when you draw closer to God, the more death you seem to draw to, closer to you. And, and this is part of the vocation, if you will. This is part of your, of your job description, that when you became a believer, God, Jesus said, Upon this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What Jesus was saying in that is, the gates of hell are going to come against you. That's what he was saying. Is the gates of hell are going to come against you. But if I'm really in there, they won't prevail. You see, and you and I have to understand, if God lives in me, then, then I, I shouldn't be surprised when Satan comes against me. And it's the true spiritual house. It's the church. It's, it's the very existence of the church as the instrument that God is going to fulfill His purpose on, the, on this earth. God is going to use the church. God, I, I know He will come and we'll be with Him one day when He finally comes on that white horse and, and all of us will be riding right behind him to destroy the antichrist but until that time he is going to use the vessel he is going to use you and me people and he's doing that even now don't 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 stop and think that he's going to do it someday when he's actually doing it right now and and if you are re really a believer maybe no one has ever told you, but you have just been enlisted. And this world is not your home. It's kind of like, I remember, and I'm sure some people can, can attest to that, but I remember even Brother Clendenin talking about that. He says, boy, they were real nice. And he said he joined up, joining to be a Marine, and they said, you know what? They, they, he said, they were real nice to me. They got me in there. They got me to sign the thing. And they said, they, they said here's, a, here's a lunch ticket. Go down to the, the place. Go get a free meal on us, this and that. And he said, but once that application went through, it was up, down, up, left, right. And he said, he said they, they, at that moment, they owned him. You see, before, before you came to know God, you do whatever you want. But once you truly came into the relationship with Him, you had better make Him Lord. Or it's going to be a miserable life for you. Because I can tell you this, if He's not your Lord, Satan's going to, make, Satan's going to play around with you. And he's going, to, he's, he's going to make a spectacle of you. And that's why we have so many bad examples of people that call themselves Christians because they've never made God Lord. And Satan loves nothing more than to put them on display because he knows that, they are not, that God is not their Lord. He knows that. But the world doesn't. And this spiritual house, it's an instrument that God is going to use for his, for his full purpose. And therefore, that it, it can, all of Satan's power will be drawn against it and exhausted. See, the life of God in the church must be manifested as greater than all the power of death itself. In other words, Jesus Christ in you has to prove to the world, to you, to everybody else around you, that greater is He that's in me. But pastor, I got bad news. Greater is He that's in me. Pastor, you, you, if, if you only knew what I've been going through for the past six months, for the past eight months, greater is He that is in you. I, I, I don't, I, you, you, can, you can put whatever you want, and you can fill in the blank however you want. 
if you don't know that, and that's what Satan doesn't want you to know, greater is he. There are three steps I'm going to give you. The first is the presence of a spiritual house, the church, and we've, we've gone over these, is a signal for satanic attack. Remember we talked even about this, that that dominant weakness in you sends out a beacon, and it, and it attracts people. There's an old saying that says, that says, like people attract like people. In other words, in other words, I don't know why, why I always draw these kind of negative people around me. Mm. That's because maybe you're a negative person. Like people attract like people. I, 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 don't, I, I don't understand why, why it just seems like I, because you're sending out a beacon. And so, so the same thing, when, when, when you and I as a spiritual house, we begin to send out a signal and, we, and, 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 and it's for satanic attack. Second, the whole effort of Satan is set against Christ's life in you and me. Understand these things. These three, three basic principles. Satan is set against you to drain every bit of life out of you. Why do you feel like sometimes, why do you think sometimes you feel like you're drowning, you're, you're, you're drained of even life itself? It feels like I, I, I just can't go on. I'm tired. Man doesn't live by bread and water alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, you and I need to continue to go to the fountain of life, the river of life, and be refilled. But Satan's job is to drain you of every drop of life the life of Christ. The third thing is, is the very working out of God's purpose through the church. It necessitates the drawing out of Satan's power for, the, for this purpose. To show the greatness of who Christ is. In other words, for the, the whole reason... The whole reason Satan attacks you, the whole reason that you got the life of Christ in you is to draw Satan's power out against you. Are you, are you serious, Pastor? That's, that's, what it's, that's what my life is going to consider. Yes. The very reason, the whole reason that, that you accepted, when you accepted Christ was so that you could draw the power out of, of Satan out against you so that, so that God could prove through you that he is greater in you and he, he can destroy the power of Satan through you. So you were delivered from death when you came to know Jesus Christ. And God is going to continue to deliver you. He has delivered you. He is delivering you. And he will yet deliver you, and He's going to continue to deliver you through His mighty power. So the course of the conflict, and, it's, and, and, and you and I have to know this, you're not called merely to go to heaven someday, but you're called to be God's spiritual house. And if you're going to, if you and I are going to, to, to bring Satan's power to, to the surface, then you and I have to prove what we are. And that's what God has done in you. And, and, and God's going to do it again and again. And every time you come into a circumstance, every time you come into a situation, you have to understand and have a mindset that the only reason that God has allowed me to go through this is because He's already given me the victory over it. The only reason that God has allowed me to come into this conflict is because He has already given me the victory. He has already proven that his power is greater. So if Satan comes, you and I can know that I've already got the victory. I just have to go out there and I have to walk in it. I, I have to prove it. So as we look at, the, at this, God is working his own goodwill and pleasure through you and me. God is God is is. is receiving the glory from our lives. And Satan has a succession of instruments as well. He started with Cain. The Bible says in 1 John 3, verse 12, he says, Cain was the evil one. He was from the evil one. He was from Satan himself. And again, you come uh, again to 
Diog, the Edomite. And, and, and some pronounce it dog, if you will. And you've got to beware of dogs. But he's a... Diog, the Edomite, watching for his advantage. And I, and I want you to, to turn with me to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel. Chapter 22. I want you to see something because... Diog, he is a, he's a rat, is what he is. He's a, he's a messenger of Satan. He's a, he's a messenger of death. He's obviously done something wrong. He finds David when David is fleeing from Saul, and, and David comes into the temple one day uh, before the priest. And, and this is the point where David, David sees Diog. And 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 Diog is 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 a spy. He's watching. Starting in verse nine. Then answered Diog the Edomite, which was set over the servants of Saul, and said, "I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob, to Amalek, the son of Ahitub, Ahitub, and he inquired of the Lord of him and gave him." victuals and gave him the sword of Goliath the Philistine then the king said to sent to call Amalek the priest the son of Ahitub and all his father's house and the priests that were at Nob and they came all of them to the king and Saul said hear now thou son of Ahitub and he answered here am I my lord and then what unfolds next is very, very evil. Because what happened was David came to, to the priest. And when he saw Diog, he didn't tell the priest exactly what was going on. Because David wanted to spare the priest's life because he knew who this man was. And so David says, well, I'm on here from the, uh, on orders of the king. He says, it was such a haste, we didn't take anything to eat, he tells the priest. He said, I didn't even take a sword in my hand. He says, well, the showbread's there, it just came out of the oven. You can have it. And then he says, do you have a sword? He says, only Goliath's sword. And David says, that's the best one in all the land. It belonged to him anyways. And so Diog was listening to all of this, but David didn't, David didn't tell him the real reason because he was in the room. And so at this moment, when, when the plan is, when, when, when Diog begins to testify against the priest because he's still looking for David, what Diog does is, is, is he, he tells the, the, the King Saul, and so Saul looks at his men and says, kill the priests, slay their, all of them, kill them all. And they wouldn't. They said, they said, we can't do this. So he looks at Diog and he says, what about you? My pleasure. And he's the one that goes in and he begins to slay the priest. He begins to slaughter the chosen of God. I can tell you this, there's, a, there's an enemy. Now, now, I want you to see this. You see, diogs are very dangerous to disciples for they, for they lurk in the shadows. See, when he saw him on that day and he went into the temple, he didn't, he didn't say anything, he just, he just observed. He's kind of like a Judas, if you will. You've got to watch out for these. I, I, I'm telling you... Um, I know a lot of people say, well, well, I'll never have. Well, I can tell you this. Jesus had one. Chances are, chances are you'll know a Judas in your lifetime. There'll be one out there trying to, 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 to work behind the scenes and trying to come up and, and they'll befriend you. They'll, they'll even talk sweetly to you. See, they don't come directly at you. Oftentimes they're the unseen enemy, but they're very deadly. Diog is divide, derived from the Hebrew word, and it's a verb meaning to be anxious, to fear. 
You see, when somebody is when somebody is feeling anxious, when they're feeling when they're, when fear, this foreboding fear comes upon them, this is exactly what it means that that there is there is an enemy that is bringing this upon you. So so whenever you feel anxious, I can tell you this: there is a spirit behind it. We we forget about that because we think that is so. So far out there, that's, that's too mystical. Come on, let's come back to reality. Well, the God that we serve, the Bible says, those that serve him and worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And I can tell you there are evil spirits all around us. And it describes an uneasiness of mind. There's an unsettling in your spirit. And, and, and I don't know about you, but maybe you work with a diog. God forbid if you live with one. But there's an uneasiness of spirit. And it results from the circumstances of life. And, and, and there, even in the time that we live in today, there's an anxiousness that is gripping the people. There is fear. There is uneasiness. There is no, there is, there is no sure foundation. Everything seems to be that, that, that where we are. We, we don't know. Everything seems to be uh, shaky underneath us. And the Bible says that a time of shaking would come and that, that the things that can be shaken would be shaken so that the things that cannot be shaken would remain. And, and why do you think these things are happening in our lives? Re remember what we've been talking about, how he speaks to the church of Philadelphia. And he says, he says, I'm going to reveal to you the ones that said they were Jews, the ones that proclaimed to be Christians, but were not. And he says, I'm going to open a door before you. And he says, and, and because this door, I'm going to prove something in your life that is going to expose something in theirs. Anybody with me? So this is exactly what's happening in our world today. There are a lot of people that have claimed to be Christians and believers. But all of a sudden, you come to a place where the ground is shaky where everything seems to be trembling and, and, and everybody, and, and I'm sorry, but even Christians today are unsettled. And, and Christians, it's proving where their trust was. It's, 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 really, it's really unfolding before us how, how what we have really put our, our hope in today. Now, I don't know about you, but I know that Jesus Christ is coming soon. And you and I have to begin to cut the ties from this, from this present life. And as we begin to cut the ties from this present life, we're not controlled by the shifting, by the shaky sand, by, by everything else that is taking place around us. I can tell you when, when, when humans or the carnal mind sees what's happening today, it becomes very anxious that, that D Diog is, is walking around and he's watching and he's observing. And God is exposing and proving to us who are the real believers, especially in times like this. You see, you can wear the uniform, but it doesn't mean you're a soldier. You know what proves a soldier? Battle. That's where soldiers are made. Not in boot camp. In battle. And see, and sometimes we look around and we wonder, well, what's going on? And I don't understand this and I don't understand. Well, you know what? I don't understand it all either, but I do know this one thing. That he's still in control. And that and and, and 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 then we have to come to that place, and we have to really come to that place where we begin to pray and intercede and say, God, I trust you, and I trust you, but but how much do I trust you? I want to trust you like Job, though he slay me, I'll follow you. 
if he leads me, wherever it is, whatever he does with my life, even if it's to the point of shedding blood, I trust him. You see, this is where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego come in. And they, they, said, they said, we don't know if he will deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we'd rather burn than bow. We'd rather, we'd rather burn than bow. Light up your furnace. Seven times hot. Put it 10, 15 times. It doesn't change my mind no matter what you do to me, no matter what comes my way because my faith doesn't rest in the things that I see. My faith doesn't rest in the things that, 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 that are around me or the, the homes that I built or this. Or, my faith rests in the Lord my God who is able to deliver me, but even if He doesn't, I'll die in honor. See, we can, we can wear the name Christ, but it doesn't mean we're any of His. See, David described his sin in the same way. He says in Psalm 38 and verse 18, he says, I confess my iniquity. I am troubled I am Deog by my sin. In other words, my sin has unsettled me. Isn't, it, isn't, that, isn't that the way that it is? When you sin, all of a sudden you're unsettled. See, and that's exactly what Satan does. That's, that's exactly what he wants out of you. Everything's going well, and as long as you're doing right, and, and, and you know that you're, you're, you're living right, and you're living for God, and, and you feel like, man, I can go in before God, and I can, and I can pray with, with confidence. But the moment you sin, I'm so sorry. Are you going to accept me? And this is that 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 dayog. This is this is that 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 unsettledness, that anxiety, that uneasiness that sin brings into our life. Jeremiah uses the word to illustrate how disciples are to be. In Jeremiah chapter seventeen and verse eight, he says, "He is like a tree planted by the water, that sends out its fruit out its roots by the stream, and it does not fear when heat comes." It doesn't fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green and is not anxious. It's not deag. He's not, he's not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. And this is what, this is what we as the disciples, as, as those children of God should be. We should not be moved no matter the circumstances we're in. Like a tree that's planted by the water, by the river itself, our roots have run deep and it doesn't matter what everything else, it doesn't matter what the landscape around us looks, we, we're not afraid. We're like a tree planted by the water. When we look at Haman, the, Ag the Agagite, scheming the death of all the Jews, and Satan has had his line of succession. And Haman, how he comes, and, and he comes subtly, if you remember, he's that Deog. He comes subtly. And he thinks that he's going to win one over. And, and, and then the king one night, if you remember, he's... He tells the servant, he says, he says, start, read to me. Go back over those inscriptions and read to me. And it was as a memorial he was bringing to remembrance some things. And that's when he remembered, oh, Mordecai. He was the one that saved me. He was the one that protected me. He was the one. See, everything was against Mordecai. And Haman himself came in. And the Bible says that he, he calls when Haman comes over. He says, Haman, he says, what would you do to the man 
that has honored the king. And how would you? And Haman's thinking, he's talking about me. You see what a fool the devil is? So he's thinking, he's talking about me. He says, well, let me tell you what I would do. I'd put the best robe on him. I'd put the rinkings signet ring on him I'd ride him around town and and I'd do and I'd show him put him on display for everybody to see what a wonderful man he's been and he says to Amy he says that's what exactly what I want you to do for Mordecai I just made some gallows for him you'll hang on him your head will be be be, be taken on those You see, God has a succession, a line. It began with Abel and onward. And every time God raised one up, the power of Satan came out against it. Because the enemy knows what to look for. Because he recognizes God's imprint upon his people. He sees what God has done in your life. He knows. And so God gives the enemy... a as we said, a lot of leeway. And it seems as if the enemy is succeeding. And how many of us can look around tonight and say, it seems like the enemy is succeeding. To the flesh, we would say, looks like he's done, a, done his job well. And, and we would fall right into that trap. If we didn't know our God. I, I, I was I, 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 hearing everything today throughout the week. Hearing about the Afghan uh, situation and the families and everybody that's affected. and So much uncertainty, so much anxiety, so much unsettled. And, and I was just, and you know, and this is the one good thing. One of the great things about being in the Word is, is, is you get to know your God. And so I was, I was sitting there, and, and all of a sudden I, that, that song came on. I know breakthrough is coming by faith. I see a miracle. My God made me a promise, and He won't stop now. Oh, I turned that thing up, and I said, played it again. And I'm telling you, I'm just sitting there because I know God is on the move. I know God is about to break through. I know because I see how the enemy has arrayed himself. I see how this, this disease has come upon the, up the land. I see what he's doing in the Middle East. I see all of these things. And what God is doing is he's letting him set himself up. And, and, and if you're a believer today, I don't know about you. It might be. It, I believe we're going to see a rapture. I believe we're going to see a mighty move of God where people are going to be delivered and healed and set free. I believe that we are going to see the greatest move that this world has ever seen. But I also know that there's a rapture that is coming. And oh my, I tell you, my God is victorious today. And so he lets him and it seems as if he's succeeding. But we have to remember all of this, that, that Satan's power and success, it's not in spite of God, but it's because of God. It's because God has allowed it. When you know this, you're encouraged to press on and press into the struggle against the enemy because you know the only reason that God is allowing him to because the greater they are, the bigger they are, the the harder they fall. And, and the greater strength that is on display and the more Satan puts out there, it's only the greater the glory that God is going to receive because of you tonight. And He's going to use you and He's going to do it through you. So God is simply drawing Satan out. And when the cup of His iniquity is full, then God will come in and show how great Christ is. We have to understand this. Give me just a, a, a couple more minutes. We have to understand what God is doing because if we don't, then we'll despair because we see the evil that evil seems to triumph in the land. 
And, and we know that this is false. We know that, that when we see evil in the land, we also have to know what God is up to so that we don't despair. And God, is not, God, is, God, God will not show His power against Satan, as we said, in his infancy, but he waits until it is full. Now, one of the great signs for you and I to see that Israel's exodus out of Egypt, because God was moving them out of Egypt, and he was getting ready to take them into the promised land. It's synchronized with the spiritual condition and the land that God was going to give them. In other words, God wasn't going to deliver them from Egypt until the land that he was going to give them was ready. Remember, we, we, we've been talking about opportunities. We've been talking about doors. And how God's opening doors. God doesn't open the door until the thing is ready. And, and here's, here's the indication. In Genesis chapter 15, when God is speaking to Abram at the time, the Bible says in, in verse 12, and when Abram, and when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell, on, uh, fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. Egypt. Somebody say Egypt. That was Egypt. They were going to stay there for four hundred years and be afflicted. And also that nation whom they shall serve, I will judge and afterward they will come out with great substance. Meaning, they took the wealth of Egypt when they came out. Now listen to what he says next. And thou, thou shalt go unto thy fathers in peace, and thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, meaning where you are, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So what God was saying, I, I'm not going to deliver them from here until their iniquity is full. Because when I bring you from here, and I'm going to judge these people by you, when I bring you from here to there, their iniquity will be full, and I am going to use you again as I bring you into this land to show my glory because they're ready to be destroyed. But God wasn't going to bring them in until those people were ready to be destroyed. And so you and I have to understand what God is doing right now. He's got a timetable. And the cup of His wrath is, is filling up. And, and I just, I, I can almost see it in my spirit. That first drop is about to fall over. It's building up. And we're right there. I believe that Jesus Christ is coming soon. But I believe that the iniquity of this world is coming to an end. And I believe that God is opening that door, that great door of opportunity to the church. Because there's going to be that one great final move of God as we prepare ourselves. This is why we have to be prepared. And that was that 40 years in the desert. That was a preparation time. I can tell you this. God says in the last days, I'm going to do a quick work. And, and we're about to see the turnaround. We're about to see the turnaround. People are hurting. There's confusion. There's anxiety. And some people are even filled with it themselves. Believers. And it's going to come to a place where they are going to seek out the truth. And they're going to come to these to, to the church. And they're going to they are going to come and and they'll get here before the before the Christians will. Because there's going to be a desire. They're going to want to be healed. They're going to want to be filled. They're going to want to be made whole again. They're going to want peace. They're wanting all of these things. And no one has anything to offer them. Only the body of Christ.
And that's what I see when I think of these times that we're living in. So church, it's time to prepare ourselves. Because God is going to use you as an instrument. And I, and I can tell you this. He can't spare one. All of us need to be ready. All of us need to be ready. And take this responsibility to be ready. So Father, tonight as we, as we just thank you, God. We thank you for your presence. We thank you, God, for what you're doing in our lives. God, I know, Father, that today, God, you are you're dealing with your people. You're you're helping us. You're you're making us aware, Father, of the things that are happening. I pray that God, that our our eyes would be open, that God, that we would know that we are not just mixing words, God. But God, what your word says is true. And Lord, we we know that, Father, that there is a great door that is opening before us. Because the enemy is showing up on every front. He thinks that this is his time. He believes that this is his hour. But God, we know that he has another thing coming. Because you are in control, Father. And you are the one that moved, moves the pieces. And God, today I pray that, Father, that you would quicken every soul, every life, every spirit. That, God, that we would not be just merely emotional Christians. But, God, we would be strengthened, Father, by your word. That, Holy Spirit, you would come upon us and you would fill us and equip us, God, for the things that are coming upon this world. I pray that, God, that you would strengthen every believer, Father, as you position them around the globe. And that, God, that you are, you are placing and you have already put us, you have already placed your assets in places, God, in very distinct places, God. And, God, you are, you are setting the stage today, Father, for the greatest move, Father, as your spirit will cover the earth one more time, God. As your word says that your spirit hovered over the deep, I know, God, your spirit will fill and cover the earth one more time. And God, in that moment, God, everything will change. and We know it, Father. And God, we want to be a part of it. I want to be a part of it. I don't want to miss out on this opportunity. I pray that, God, that we would not despise the days, Father, of small beginnings, and we would not despise these things because, God, it's those small things, God, that bring about the great blessings. So, God, I pray that in Jesus' name, as you touch our hearts and move upon our lives, God, that you would help us, strengthen us, so that we would bring glory and honor to you. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Praise God. So good. Amen. So good to be in God's house. So good to be with you this evening. We're so thankful. Uh, and I'm so thankful to the word of, for the word of God. And uh, be, be encouraged. And uh, if you haven't in a while, pick up your Bible and begin to read it. Begin to, begin to go through it. It'll, it'll, it'll actually strengthen you and give you hope, in the, in, especially in the times, in the midst of troubled times. And I believe that I know that in Jesus' name. We love you and God bless you. And we look forward to seeing you on Sunday. 